credit for everybody that's on time. Thank you for being here and part of the session. I'm sure more people would be joining. My name is Kyle Chang. I've been a uh, person with chronic kidney disease since 2013, and I had that surprise diagnosis, didn't land me in the emergency room for three and a half weeks before I was able to get discharged and uh, went into in-center uh, in center hemodialysis to start, knew nothing about home modalities at the time, and then I spent five and a half years doing peritoneal dialysis as well as home hemodialysis. So I've been through it all, and um, now I am post-transplant, uh, just two months from uh, my three-year anniversary post-transplant, so yay! Uh, uh, <laughs> thanks to the deceased donor and their surviving families. Now, today's session, we are going to be talking about why peritoneal dialysis may be good for you and how peritoneal dialysis is a good option. Is it not such a good option? A answering some of your questions. So once again, feel free to use that QA anytime during the session to put in any of the questions throughout the presentation. We're going to get started with some basic information about some of the benefits and trade-offs, as well as um, some catheter types that might be options for you when doing peritoneal dialysis. And also, um, let's talk about uh, when do you know if um, peritoneal dialysis is working well for you at the beginning, during, or towards the end of your peritoneal dialysis or before transplant? So with me today are some other excellent panelists. Dr. Bernie, is, um, it's great to see you again. We did a similar session with American Kidney Fund uh, just a few months ago. And Dr. Bermudez is the director of acute dialectic therapies and the home hemodialysis program at Geisinger Medical Center. Her work focuses on optimizing care of patients requiring dialysis by promoting home therapies, education, and empowering patients and healthcare professionals. So thanks for being with us. Uh, Trisha Patterson is an experienced home dialysis nurse with DaVita, uh, actually right, uh, in center dialysis clinic for quite a while there, in and out. And uh, she has published articles in Nephrology, Nursing Journal on home hemodialysis and access issues. She was also an author for peritoneal dialysis chapter in the current sixth edition of the Contemporary Nephrology Nursing Textbook. Thanks for being here today. And of course, we have a social worker and also um, a patient extraordinaire, Alicia Ennis. She's a professional social worker and recent transplant recipient. So congratulations on your recent transplant there. Thank you. Uh, looks like you had peritoneal dialysis experience also with your kidney journeys for two years. Um, but your um, dialysis journey um, it started about 10 years ago, around the time I did. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later for the folks that are here. Uh, with that, let's give you some background on peritoneal dialysis for folks that may not be too familiar. And we'll breeze right through that and get into more of the uh, nitty gritty of the session today. So Dr. Bernudis, uh, tell us a little bit about peritoneal dialysis, what it is, and also, you know, what are some of the access types that might be available for patients? Thank you, Kyle. And welcome, everyone, to our session. Uh, Certainly an honor to, to share this virtual uh, podium with this wonderful group of uh, people. So with that, I'm going to get started uh, to learn about how peritoneal dialysis works. So we refer to it as PD, peritoneal dialysis. I'm going to share um, a picture with you guys um, here. Can you see my slides? Yes, yeah. Very good. So, so the way peritoneal dialysis works is by utilizing a, a membrane or a structure that we have in our abdomen. Uh, this is a membrane that is under uh, the skin and muscles of our, of our abdomen that is covering our abdominal cavity. Uh, think about it as a blanket, as a cushy filter that is going to be acting as a actual filter. So the way this works, um, they're going to be putting a, a, an access, we call it the peritoneal dialysis catheter. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the different locations of this access. And, and this is a plastic tube that is going to be connecting the outside with the inside of your abdomen. So the way, the way this works, as you can see here, there's no need for needles and there's not gonna be blood outside the body. We are gonna be putting some uh, fluid inside the abdomen th through this uh, catheter. This fluid, we refer to it as dialysate and is basically a clean solution that has some sugar and some electrolytes. So then that's gonna go into our abdomen 
and that membrane is going to act as a filter and it's going to absorb all the good things from this solution. And in exchange, it's going to allow impurities, waste products, excess of water and salt to come out through the same tube. So, so we do three phases on this uh, treatment. We fill the abdomen with the fluid, then we let filtration happen. We call it the dwelling time, and then we filter or we allow it to drain. So filling, dwelling, and draining. So um, there's different types of accesses. Um, basically, it's the same plastic tube. There could be different locations in your abdomen, sometimes even closer to your chest if there's some um, anatomical considerations or some, some uh, situation in your abdomen where the catheter could be located in a different place. Uh, this is a simple procedure. Uh, a surgeon or a radiologist is going to do this as an in, in and out ambulatory uh, minor surgery. Um, and this will allow us to, to proceed with the treatment. So you will need a membrane that is healthy, that doesn't have a lot of scarring, meaning that if you've had a lot of abdominal surgeries, sometimes that might have to be uh, evaluated to make sure your membrane uh, is healthy and is going to be a good filter. Um, so then um, I think we're going to talk more during the session about, you know, things we're going to look at at the home and, and, of course, all the other requirements that we will take into account uh, to make sure you're able to um, perform this type of dialysis. Awesome. And I think there's a presternal PD catheter. Do you folks use that a lot over at Geisinger or uh, in which That is actually, and, and I don't have a picture, but that's correct. So it would be located here. I don't know if you can see me here yeah, in the sternum. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's not the most common access, at least in our area, and I believe probably across the, across the board. Uh, you will require special uh, surgeons to be able to put it in. I have had a few amount of patients with them and, and they work very good as well. Uh, your team will help determine which is best for you. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Bermudez. Uh, let's go over to Alicia. Alicia, did you know about peritoneal dialysis when you first realized you had chronic kidney disease? What was your diagnosis like since you also had experience with hemodialysis? So um, at first I didn't because like it kind of just happened. So I kind of had to like my stories are kind of weird. So I had a kind of the day of I had to be I had to rush to the hospital. This is actually my doctor right here, Dr. Bermuda. She's actually my doctor of 10 years. And um, she actually um, first put me on hemo. And while I was doing hemo for a little while, she was like, hey, have you heard of PD? And I told her no. And she's explained everything thoroughly to me. And I decided that we should try it. Awesome. Yeah, you know, I, I had a similar crash into uh, the hospital the emergency room there, as I mentioned before, and um, I knew nothing about home therapies for five months. So I was doing in-center hemodialysis, and there's a lot of folks at that dialysis center. We have pediatrics unit as well as uh, folks that uh, had lost limbs and different things. So sometimes that was um, heartening in, in terms of going in every day to that particular center uh, right off the start and being a little bit afraid. Um, so. Uh, did you start PD right away or did you do uh, hemodialysis first? I was actually on hemo for about a month, but while I was on hemo, I want to say like the last two weeks of hemo, I started um, PD training. I had my, um, I actually had two catheters, I had my PD placed and I also had my hemo up here. So while we was making sure that works, I was going through the trainings, how to do it. And it was, it's actually fairly easy to go through the trainings, but once I did that, I was able to come home. And then for the last two years, I've been home. Wow. Yeah. And I think uh, maybe folks didn't see you on camera, but sometimes they put a chest uh, CBC catheter or around yeah. the chest or the neck for the emergency hemodialysis start. Um, uh, Dr. Bermudez and also Nurse Patterson, who are great candidates for a peritoneal dialysis, in your opinion, and based on your experience? So, so I, can, I can start, uh, Tricia. Um, so, I would start with saying that most patients are great candidates. Um, you know, if you're very independent, if you like traveling, if you have your work, um, you know, 
if you actually are a caregiver of someone, you're realizing the, 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 the benefit of, of doing peritoneal dialysis at home will make you a wonderful candidate for this therapy. Um, patients that um, have weak hearts are actually very good candidates for this type of dialysis. Uh, it's very gentle. As I mentioned earlier, uh, because there's no blood outside of, of the body, it's, it's more uh, slow, it's gentle, it mimics what our kidneys do for us, probably very similar, uh, less in a less um, um, aggressive way, so to speak. So there's there's going to be less fluctuation of your blood pressure. So, so patients that are very healthy do fantastic, but also a very unique population where hearts are a little weak could also be uh, doing very well on this type of, of dialysis. Uh, Trisha, any 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 other uh, ideas? Um, so the flip side of the patients that would have a hard time with peritoneal dialysis would be those who had previous surgery and the and there's just a lot of scarring in the peritoneum. But I've also had difficulty with patients who are diabetics and their blood sugars are just so high that we don't get a good um, gradient is the word, but if the blood sugar is higher than the sugar that water that we put in, we're not able to get the toxins to move the direction we want and the fluid. So that that would be one that would kind of rule out PD is a good option if you're a diabetic uncontrolled. Um, but we've had, I had a patient who was on a yacht and was able to do his dialysis living on his yacht. I have had a patient who lived in a group home and we were able to set it up for her. So most situations were able to adapt. Um, you can make some space. You can have two week delivery instead of four week delivery. So you have less amount of supplies each time. We try and make it work. Trish, I love, I love what you're saying because I think Kyle has heard me saying this before and, and I think this is a good message for us to relay. I would tell everyone listening here that, that don't assume that there's going to be contraindications after you meet with your team. There's a lot of barriers that we can overcome. Um, you know, having an enthusiastic, loving team, uh, I, I have to say in many, many situations, patients were deemed not candidates and, and we could make it uh, work. Yes. Uh, a, a very unique uh, one is that we've mentioned the, the history of uh, surgeries in the past. I've learned my lesson. You know, I, I, I now ask my expert uh, surgeons, the, the ones that put these to, to give me their input. And I have number no, a lot of patients that we thought they couldn't do it and they actually were fine. You know, we, we were able to actually do a test where they would look with the laparoscope, minor incision, look with a camera, and objectively assess whether the membrane was healthy or not, as, as opposed to us assuming. And in many occasions, patients did fine, and we were able to do it. Um, there's other situations you may have come across um, that I think would be important to mention. Uh, patients that have a disease called uh, polycystic kidney disease where it's, it's common, where their kidneys could be very large, you know, it's not always a contraindication. Um, you might hear that there's not enough space in the abdomen for the fluid because of very large kidneys, but that could be a condition that maybe limit, you know, the, the, the comfort um, on this type of therapy, but not always. Um, other conditions that um, there's misconceptions about not uh, being candidate for dialysis, uh, peritoneal dialysis, are, for example, uh, patients that had a liver transplant before. Uh, that actually is not true. Uh, we are able to successfully uh, do peritoneal dialysis on those patients as well. Mm -hmm. um, not making a lot of urine is another common misconception. Um, I don't think that can be a general uh, uh, idea. There are patients that don't make a lot and they can still do uh, well on this type of therapy. So I think, you know, each case was, is going to be unique. And uh, my, my advice for everyone is, is to explore it. Uh, explore it, make sure all barriers can, can be assessed and potentially overcome. 
Yeah, and I was uh, excited to try and get back to traveling and also work more. Um, so that was, I was diagnosed at 38. So um, if you can't, people like me at that age, um, we're, we're not made to be sitting in center for a long time. So um, that was one of my reasons for going to PD. And my rationale was also, um, hey, you know what? Home, the hemodialysis in the clinics are still going to be there if PD doesn't work, so I'm going to give that a shot as well. So great points, Dr. Bermudez. Um, we have lots of questions coming in already from the folks listening to the session. It touches on something that um, Nurse Passion mentioned, which is the amount of supplies. Um, I know that first supply delivery, uh, Alicia, I'm not sure it happened to you as well. Um, was that very shocking for the first delivery? And uh, how much supply storage room should people expect? So um, it was a little overwhelming when I first got it, but um, I'm lucky enough because how my room is set up, I have a little spare bedroom inside of my room. So I was able to fit all my boxes back there. I saw Linda, she posted about shelves. I personally wouldn't recommend putting them on shelves because how heavy the boxes actually are, especially the, the giant, um, for the giant cylinder bags, those I wouldn't recommend putting on shelves because I feel like they will break the shelves. I stored mine on the floor, but I had a little sheet on there just in case like a box broke or anything. It was something to protect the floor. That's what I would recommend. Yeah, and Nurse Patterson, do, you, do, do your patients usually get that big uh, first uh, delivery? And what might be a reason? It is a lot the first time because we don't know exactly what the patients are gonna need and we wanna give them all the options so that they can choose. And once you start doing dialysis every night at home, you start to see a pattern of what you're gonna need, different strengths of solution so you can cater it more. Um, but we try and give you all the options when you start. But the delivery guys are very good and they will stack them for you about five boxes high and they'll sort them yellows, greens, reds, and, and they'll even rotate the old ones to the front if you ask them to. So they're really good with the deliveries. Yeah, fantastic driver over the years. Um, so also uh, something that came up, we talked about folks with uh, maybe diabetes or high uh, blood sugars that needs to be managed. Does that deter them from PD? And um, also um, I understand there's an icodextrin extraneous solution that sometimes is utilized. Uh, can Great Dr. Bermudez and Nurse Patterson uh, talk a little bit more about that? Go ahead, doctor. Oh, I can, I can give it a try. So, so, so very good questions, excellent questions, especially diabetes being such a common uh, disease. So, so as Nurse Patterson mentioned, it, it in occasion can be hard to control the sugars because as I mentioned, the, the solution where I put it in has sugar in it. There's a lot of things we do to, to make it work. Um, there's a way that we can give you an idea, help you learn count calories the same way you would do with your meals when you have diabetes and actually work with the diabetes experts to help you understand how much extra insulin you need to ad administer almost the same as you were counting your calories with your meal. So that, that's a strategy that is extremely helpful. As you learn how to do these, you're also going to learn how to um, manage the, the, the type of solutions you, you realize. So, so if, if possible, we're going to try to help you, you know, minimize the amount of sugar exposure. And with that, is that um, alternative that Kyle mentioned, which is a different type of solution that is a sugar, but is not glucose. It's something different. It's called maltose. Uh, and it actually is a great option for diabetics. Uh, there, there are things we take into, into consideration to, to see if a patient can utilize this solution. But bottom line, we have a lot of different strategies uh, to help you uh, control your diabetes and, and be successful on peritoneal dialysis. Good answer. Yeah. Was there anything else you'd like to add to that, Nurse Patterson? Um, no, I think that was what we're doing. The icodextrin we like to use during the daytime for the long dwell, and it really does help remove fluid. It's really good. Yeah, and I know um, sometimes uh, patients are with Fresenius, and that's something made by Baxter. So Fresenius has their own uh, warehouse and supply network that sometimes uh, they have to do a special order. So if you're with the Fresenius network of clinics, um, sometimes you may need to request that with your nephrologist in consultation to have that special order as well. Um, 
So, um, Aisha, sometimes people are a little bit conscious about sort of the PD dupe hanging off their abdominal area and being outside their bottom body. That's a little bit visible when they go out um, or maybe on the beach. Um, did you experience any of those concerns? And uh, how hard was it for you to keep that from being contaminated? So, um, I actually taped mine down so you get medical tape with your um with your supplies. And I also had, they had this PD belt that also came with it. So I had a belt that was on. I wasn't big of a beach person. So I never really been, but I know like from being in the pool, I saw someone ask about swimming. When I used to go to my friend house to the pool, I had a higher like bathing suit, but I also I taped it down and like put it underneath my bathing suit so you can't see it. But at first you are self-conscious about it. But after a while, like you just kind of forget that is there. And I always, tape is really good. But also remember if you do go swimming to always clean your exit site and put new cloth back on it. Yeah, that was what I was taught as well. I used to swim a lot when I was younger and um, I wasn't expecting to while I was on dialysis or PD. And uh, after about a year, my nephrologist says, hey, did you know you could actually swim on PD? I'm like, oh, really? How do you how do you do that? And I learned about it and then sort of weighed the risk for myself. And I'm like, oh, that's too much work for me to sort of claim <laughs> right outside after I get out of the um, ocean and things like that. So I chose not to do it. But certainly there are ways to do that. And uh, excellent nurses and nephrologists could help you along the way to make sure that you uh, keep it from being contaminated and avoid infections there. Um, so let me see if there's any other, you know, Randall also asked, um, PD, how does it affect you physically and any other health conditions uh, doing or while you're doing peritoneal dialysis or after the treatments? Um, did you experience anything? Um, for me, compared to hemodialysis, it was certainly a lot easier since I did at night and I, I just knocked out and slept at night, got up uh, sort of disconnected and I was on my way to go. And uh, because I was doing PD um, every day, it, I actually felt better than the up and down of hemodialysis in center. Um, what was your experience like, Alicia? I definitely, with PD, I definitely had so much more energy to do stuff because with hemo, it did take a lot out of me and going to in center every day and having to sit there. But with PD, it was much more convenient. I would just get on at night and just sleep through it. And it was comfortable. Um, a lot of times I would forget that I was even connected at night because once I fall asleep, you don't feel it unless like you lay on it and you get an alarm and that's when the alarm will wake you up. But other than that, it was... I didn't have any physical limitations at first to tell you don't lift up a certain amount of weight. But afterwards, I was healed and everything. I was fine. Uh, I was working out. I was going out with my friends, visiting people, visiting family. So I had a really good experience with PD and I didn't really have any physical limitations. Yeah, me neither until they removed both kidneys. <laughs> I was one of those uh, patients that had an open double nephrectomy prior to my transplant as well for a different reason. We'll talk about that in a different session some other day. Um, great questions coming in so far from the folks attending and also in the audience. Keep them coming in the QA section if you want to type along. But um, there was a couple other things that came in uh, pre-session um, that they wanted to talk about. So how long can somebody stay on PD? Um, for me, it, it really was that open double nephrectomy that I talked about where they tried to place a second PD catheter after five and a half years of working fine. Uh, when, when they had that surgical recovery and tried to place a second catheter, it didn't work as well for me because it was wrapped around the omentum. And at the time, uh, my nephrologist and I actually um, decided instead of having more surgical risk and infection risk from surgery, um, we would just hit, move over to home hemodialysis for myself. But um, if nothing else is going around, how long can somebody stay on peritoneal dialysis and what might be some other reasons where they need to discontinue peritoneal dialysis? Very good. So that's a wonderful question, very important. Um, so it, it actually depends. There are patients that are able to stay on peritoneal dialysis for several years. Um, it depends on a lot of different things. Um, strategies to, to help peritoneal dialysis last longer are important. Uh, so good adherence to your therapy, being compliant, you know, uh, avoiding uh, potential toxic medications to your kidneys. Um, so we try to really preserve your urine output. If you start this type of dialysis, you're still making urine, 
you will learn how that piece is such important part of peritoneal dialysis. Patients that are able to continue to make urine for, for a long time tend to be patients that are able to stay on peritoneal dialysis longer. Um, so the, the reason for which, one of the reasons uh, for which a person cannot stay for it, on it for, for too long time is because with the sugar exposure over the years, the membrane as a filter wears off a little bit. So we could see, and as I said, it depends on the patient. Uh, we could see signs that the filter is no longer doing the job we wanted to do. Um, so so if, if the patient is accumulating fluid again, we're not getting all our um, numbers and our blood were the way we did before, this, those could be indicators that perhaps the membrane is getting a little tired. Um, but as I said, you know, we, we have medications to try to, to uh, help the membrane last longer. We continue to be mindful of protecting uh, what your kidneys are still doing as long as we can, uh, and each patient is going to be different. I don't think I have a magic number, but I do believe there are patients that have been on it for more than eight, nine, ten years. That could be a unique situation, uh, to be honest, but it is it is possible, and it depends on the person. Yeah, and oftentimes we get new folks coming into dialysis thinking their life might be over or they only have three to five years to live. And with all the different uh, methods of doing dialysis and modern technology of keeping us alive quite well, um, I think folks could definitely learn, uh, live quite long even on uh, dialysis. But ultimately, if you're able to get a transplant, I think that's going to be the best treatment option, the golden treatment option. Um, Nurse Patterson, if I could ask you to talk about um, some of the infection risks and what you do with patients that help some stay on peritoneal dialysis a little bit longer. So the training is about eight sessions long. We can get it done usually in about two weeks. And right from the beginning, we teach uh, a two minute hand wash with all the different steps that you have to do for washing your hands each time. And hand washing is just so basic and so important and you should never skip it. Um, patients wear a mask every time. I had one patient who got an infection. He says, oh, I just held my breath. And I'm like, yeah, that doesn't work. We need to wear the mask. And we've kind of gotten used to wearing masks since COVID, um, but it is important aspect. So we teach everyone right at the beginning how to do perfect connections that um, do not contaminate. I had a lady who was uh, blind and she was able to do her connections for years and never contaminated. So if the patients follow every step, you don't have to get an infection. Yeah, definitely take the time and training to ask your questions and, and be sure you learn the steps and follow it because I think a lot of times the infection risk is increased when folks sort of skip steps or think that they get complacent and they're like, oh yeah, I'll just take care of this and do that and um, that, that's where mistakes tend to happen. But once you're connected securely and safely or disconnected securely and safely. Your mask um, comes off and you're yep. completely safe. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so uh, there were some questions and comments in the room here from folks about uh, where the catheter is placed. So we talked about um, a lot of times it's in the abdominal area, but sometimes specialized surgeons can place the presidential PD catheter uh, a little bit higher up in the chest. So when you go through and consider peritoneal dialysis and your catheter placement, talk with the surgeon to see where it would be best for you and do that in consultation with your dialysis nurse as well as your nephrologist. Um, and um, yeah, sometimes they could certainly place it a little bit higher. Thanks for that comment, Michael, um, especially for the ladies above waistline. Um, did you have any special consideration, Alicia, in terms of the placement of your PD catheter or uh, did you just sort of get rolled in and let them do what they need to do? I just let them do what they do. So like any ladies, I wear high-waisted jeans and like high-waisted skirts. So um, I didn't have any issues with the tugging or anything. One big thing is, um, I was taught to tape it down so you don't pull at the exit site. A good, this, I can't stress enough, if you tape it down, I, I found it's the least amount of problems, especially with my high waist jeans. And I had no problems throughout the day. Once I fixed it right, I didn't have any problems for the rest of the day. All right, um, and I had a PD catheter belt, so the clinic gave me a couple of those when I started. I don't think they do that, issue that as much for 
patients, but you can certainly buy them online through Amazon or other resources. Um, uh, but yeah, PD belt works nicely, and it's sort of you know tighten my belly a little bit, make me a little look a little bit nicer when I go out uh, tucked in, um, and that nicely tucked in that PD catheter for me as well. Um, um, did you ha experience any issues with sleeping while you did peritoneal dialysis, Alicia? At first, yes, because I always slept on my left side or like sometimes I would sleep on my stomach. So I had to get used to not sleeping that way. At first, you got it is this muscle memory. That's how you slept. But after a while, you get used to it. You get tired of hearing an alarm go off and waking mm -hmm. you up. But it was it was always comfortable. I slept fine. I even had a little dog. Once I was connected, she didn't sleep beneath my covers, but she slept in the bed with me and we we were good. So I didn't have any difficulties at all. Yeah, you know, I had similar situation at the very beginning during training when that fluids sort of filling you up and feeling a little uncomfortable you sort of your peritoneal uh, cavity tends to expand over time and get used to it and then you adjust sort of diet and uh, I ended up learning to eat um, earlier in the day for breakfast and lunch and that often helped me be a little bit more uncomfortable for the nighttime treatments as well um, there's a couple of really um, medical specific related questions so we're not going to dive into that on this session here um so uh louise kenneth and Randall, i would say um talk to your own nephrologist as well as your uh, pd nurse there um and uh just follow their direction on those particular medical questions we want to you know everybody has a different health history and things body chemistry works a little bit different between different people and you have other different medications or treatment that may be applicable um, so we don't want to give you any wrong answers um, on that as well um, so there are um, let's talk about some of the prescription things. I think um, that is different than other modalities of dialysis, such as home hemo or in-center hemodialysis. And Dr. Bermuda, uh, you mentioned the, uh, sort of being more gentle on folks. Um, what would be sort of the average time on new patients um, in terms of their treatment times and options? And Nurse Patterson, please feel free to chime in as well, based on your experience. Um, you know, how many hours, how many times a week do we do this? And what is the reason why we do that on peritoneal dialysis versus the other modalities? Very good. So uh, I would start with, uh, there's two different ways uh, we can do peritoneal dialysis. So one is manual, we call it CAPD, Continuous Ambulatory Peritoneal Dialysis, CAPD. Basically, uh, you will learn how to connect your catheter to the solution that is going to go in into your abdomen, and you will do that manually. You will have a, you know, IV pole, like the one you see in the hospitals where they hang the back, so you will be comfortable in your chair or bed, and you will learn how to hook it up manually. Depending on the patient, um, if, if you do the manual type of peritoneal dialysis, you are looking probably at getting between two to four exchanges a day. Usually you're going to do it during the daytime. Uh, depending on the patient, you will be told how long to leave this, the solution with it within your abdomen. So basically you hook up, you administer the fluid, you lock your catheter, you go on with your life go to work, do whatever you need to do, and you will know what time to go back and drain, you know, do the draining session, and then you will feel again, leave it again for some hours. And again, that would be depending on the patient. Um, the other type is what uh, Kyle and Alicia shared with us, uh, the way they did it, uh, and is using a machine, we call it a cycler, and most patients do it, do it during the comfort of the nighttime. So you will learn how to hook up the catheter to your cycler. Um, when your nurses visit your home, they're going to help you um, find the best place where this is going to be located uh, that is going to be comfortable for you. And they're wonderful to help you really set up your, your, your dialysis uh, space. Um, but anyways, you're going to connect uh, to, the, to the cycler. You're going to go to sleep. And most patients are going to be connected for about somewhere between, I'm going to say eight hours is a good average, could be a little more, could be a little less, depending on the person. I'll take this opportunity to mention that that doesn't mean you have to be asleep for nine hours. You know, I get this all the time from my patients. They're worried because they don't sleep more than four or five hours. So they automatically think 
they cannot do this type of dialysis. That's actually not true. You know, all we need you to is to be connected to your treatment. But once you're ready to be awake and maybe, you know, read a book, watch the news, doesn't matter. You know, you'll just complete the time connected to your cycler. Uh, don't have to be sleeping per se. Um, so that's, I think, an average uh, treatment time. Yeah, Nurse Patterson, is that a similar start? Do you have any patients? Um, we've started to hear some of the nephrologists and clinics do um, shorter peritoneal dialysis, especially with people with higher residual functions when they're starting, um, you know, right at GFR 15 um, and they're urinating quite a bit. So do you have um, a patients that have a little bit of uh, alteration in that schedule? Uh, looks like you're still muted. <laughs> When we are calculating what's called adequacy, we're trying to see how much toxins are cleared from the solution from your body. So PD does two things. It's going to clear fluids and it's also going to clear toxins. We have to consider both of those things. But when we calculate the adequacy, we also count how much toxins are cleared by your residual kidney function, how much is in the urine. So we add those numbers together. So people who are still making a good amount of urine just need a little assistance from the dialysis to remove the rest. We really don't count on the PD to remove fluid from the people who are still making urine. So we could have like put 2000 in, take 2000 out and a net of zero because the amount of fluid is removed by the urine. And so then all we're needing to do is remove toxins. And with the help of the kidneys removing some toxins, it puts less requirement on the dialysis. And so we don't need to do dialysis every day if that's their situation. So we can reduce it down to six days a week or five days a week. Sometimes people would prefer to do seven days a week, but shorter time each night. So we can be flexible as long as we get an adequate amount of dialysis, which our number is 1.7 for seven days. So you do the calculations as if it was for a week. And then we can fluctuate what works with the patient. And to finish what Dr. Bermuda was saying about being able to walk around while you're connected, the tubing is about 20 feet, 25 feet long. So you're not staying in one chair the whole time. You can get up and go to the bathroom, walk around your room. Some people put a little mini fridge in their room, television, computer. So you can be moving around while you're on the dialysis. Hello. Along with that, I see Daniel asked the question, is it common practice for folks to be trained on manual PD before the cycler? It used to be, but they're not doing that as much anymore. We just train a couple of sessions so that everyone knows how to do the manual. That's your emergency backup if the power goes out. But, um, and I like to do it that way too, because they can see the 2000 that goes in instead of that large six liter bag and people think you're not going to put all that in me. No, that's to last all night. Um, so we do teach both, but most people choose to do the cycler. I, I agree, uh, Patricia, that's exactly our practice. Um, and, and I couldn't agree more. I think learning both is so important. Uh, for the emergencies, um, you know, sometimes say you're going to go away for the weekend just from one day to the other. You cannot take the cycler with you. You know, we, you, you're very dynamic that way and you could perhaps, you know, utilize your cycler or do it, do it manually. Um, and to echo everything uh, uh, Patricia mentioned, I, the one thing that I find excellent about peritoneal dialysis is, is as you can see how we tailor everything to our patients. So how much you're going to need depends on, on you and only you and how much your kidneys are working and what your lifestyle looks like and what your hobbies are and your work. So so your prescription is going to be very unique uh, to you. So, so do not try to compare yourself to maybe someone you know on peritoneal dialysis. Your, your prescription may be completely different and it might really work for you. 
Yeah, I'm going to echo the um, learning both the manuals as well as the cycler. Um, obviously, if they could shorten the training time and get you started on cycler and get you home quicker, that's a good option. But learning it and sort of practicing along the way, the manual um, is also helpful because there's certainly days where I'm away at conferences or have long days or I might want to be out with um, other uh, friends of mine uh, a little bit later at night and can't connect right away at my regular schedule cycler time. So my nurses were able to do some alterations on that. Um, and one of my favorite topics to travel uh, talk about with peritoneal dialysis is the ease of travel. Um, it tends to be much easier than the other modalities uh, in my years. Um, and I'm not sure, Alicia, if you had a chance to travel while you were doing PD or not. Um, I know a lot of folks that are cruising um, tends to do manuals and they don't have to bring the cycler with them and risk the cycler not working while they're at sea. Um, but in, in what ways did you use uh, maybe the manual method of um, peritoneal dialysis versus a cycler? Yeah, um, I was taught on manual backs first and because I didn't, my cycler came a little late, so I had to do a little bit manual backs. But actually, I went and I traveled to my friend's house, to my family house in a different state. And all I did was just account for how many days I was gone. I let my center know, of course, and my doctor that I was going and how long I was going for. And that's basically you just got to just communicate and know how many bags to take with you and what the strengths are and just make sure you keep track of time too. And you don't miss, like if you do doing manual, you don't miss your treatment time window, but you are a little flexible on um, when you have to actually drain out. Yeah, certainly. And that's helpful on cruises. And I actually got to do that on uh, one project where I worked in a whole different state, Philadelphia, for several months. And I just grabbed the empty conference room and did my manuals while I was at work. And then we had 20 hour work days there and I was still rolling along and then uh, did my cycler treatments uh, once I got back to uh, home from the office and things like that. Um, all right, so um, there's a question also from Randy. Can you get into a hot tub on peritoneal dialysis? Is that recommended or, um, you know, I see some shaking. <laughs> Patricia, I'll let you, I'll, let you yeah. <laughs> I'll give you the honor. <laughs> yeah, hot tubs are one of the things that we don't do. And you can't get into your own bathtub either if the catheter is going to be submerged you would have to have water lower than the level of your catheter. So people who have pre they have that option. Yes, and, and there's particularly worries and bacteria uh, that like um, tops. Uh, one of them is called Pseudomonas, uh, could be a very bad infection to have. So, so yes, I, I couldn't agree more. I would stay away from that. Yeah, uh, vector and then, you know, vector with the heat and <laughs> sort of the water bloating, just similar to the same effect of bathing. Uh, sometimes you're trying to get all that dirty stuff off and then it sits in the tub and that collects up. So you don't want to do the infection risk. Um, folks that are still part of our session, feel free to drop in any uh, questions or comments uh, in the Q&A section. We have probably about uh, seven, 10 minutes left in the session today. Um, if you'd like to get any pressing and questions answered, that's not sort of tailored to your individual health history there. Um, let's talk about some of the tests that would uh, tell us. Um, Alicia, what were some of the routine tests as a patient perspective that you had to do um, to sort of get a gauge of whether or not that peritoneal dialysis was still working for you? Um, like Patricia um, mentioned, it's adequacy. I did that a lot. Uh, and blood work too was a lot to make sure uh, everything was still working well. Um, for adequacy, I just had to bring in my fluid into the center and give them to my nurses, who was amazing, and my amazing doctor right here. Um, it wasn't it wasn't difficult. The test was just blood work once a month, and then to come back in um, the same month and meet with them, and we went over results, and um, it wasn't too strenuous or anything like that. Awesome. And uh, Dr. Bermudez, Nurse Hatchman, any other um, tests that folks either starting out or um, continuing on PD in terms of besides adequacy that you'd be concerned with uh, that yes. they may be aware of? So I, I think that was a good summary. So every month uh, you will get lab work once a month and that would be blood work. Um, if you're still making uh, urine, you're going to be asked to collect your urine over 24 hours. Uh, depending on the center, this may be every month or every other month. It can be depending on your particular situation, but that's something we will do 
uh, frequent. Um, and also, as Alicia mentioned, we're going to ask you to bring us the uh, bag in the morning and you will know exactly what to bring to us. And that is to check all of those impurity um, molecules that we're going to be checking in the urine so we know how much your kidneys are cleaning your blood and we add that up to the same uh, sort of uh, components, compounds that we're going to be checking on that fluid that you bring to us. Um, this occasionally, uh, the catheter may be a little bit slow to drain, that's not uncommon. Um, I, I think this is a good time, even though it's a little off topic to the question, to mention that you might need x-rays of your abdomen at times, just to make sure the catheter has not migrated a little bit. To prevent that, making sure we do not have constipation is so important. So, you know, having a good bowel movement regimen is pivotal to do great on peritoneal dialysis. So, as I said, occasionally you might require an x-ray of your belly uh, to see uh, how the, uh, the, the cut that is located. Um, there's other things that will help us understand how your membrane works. And there's a study that you will learn in more detail when you do start peritoneal dialysis if you choose this modality. And it will help us understand the type of membrane that you have, how it works. That's a little more technical. And that's also easy. Uh, it's just collecting a little bit of the fluid that comes out after we do an exchange. And you will learn all about that when the time comes. But yeah, again, I think you're referring to the PET or the peritoneal equilibrium. Yeah, 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 PET, peritoneal equilibration test. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, Nurse Patterson, uh, several questions came in about, um, and I promise to get to the CPAP there uh, question, and, but uh, several questions come up about diet. So any particular diets with peritoneal dialysis and also uh, with labs, sometimes these labs uh, tie in with the nutritionist who's not on our panel today, unfortunately, but. So um, once people up. switch from CKD to end-stage renal disease, um, they won't be seeing their nephrologist at that office anymore. They'll be seeing a nephrologist at the PD clinic. And at that PD clinic, that's once a month. You'll discuss those lab results, your specific lab results. There'll be a dietitian, a social worker, the nurse, the doctor, all in that clinic visit and your support person. So it's a pretty crowded room. Um, but we're going to go over those specific labs and be able to make changes to your diet. So before you start dialysis, your potassium tends to be too high. Once you're on PD, we're clearing potassium every day, and sometimes it's too low, so you need to eat more potassium. So we're going to change your diet month by month, depending on your lab results. Increase your protein that you need to take. When you're CKD, we want you to stop eating so much protein and preserve that kidney. And once you've switched to ESRD, now we need you to eat protein every day because you're losing protein in the urine and also in the dialysis, so we want you to eat protein. So there's some major diet changes once you switch to um, end-stage renal disease, and you're going to have a dietitian that sees you every month or twice a month to go over your labs and give you specific diet help. So uh, I guess uh, Luis is sending us a little poll here in the room chat there. What would be the hardest, in your opinion, uh, to manage relating to diet, hardest to control? Is it the sodium, phosphorus, potassium, or protein? It's um, the, I think for Phosphorus. <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's sort of yes. hidden in everywhere, right? Yes, yes. And, and, and it's because um, no dialysis, peritoneal dialysis or in center dialysis, they're not very efficient, uh, unfortunately, to, to help remove phosphorus. So, so we do rely on a diet, on those binders that fields that actually will help remove the phosphorus from the food for those that are not familiar with those. Um, so yes, definitely phosphorus. I agree with that. And, yeah, and I would yeah. say that the, sorry, the, the potassium and the, and the protein uh, usually is such a satisfying aspect of peritoneal dialysis, um, as you know, patients may now able uh, to enjoy summer fruits and tomatoes and, and things that they could not enjoy before. 
Yeah, I was able to move um, once from in-center hemodialysis, had a more restrictive diet and flu plan. And then once I went to peritoneal dialysis, um, I was able to do a more plant-based diet as opposed to, um, you know, uh, being very limiting. I was used to eating a lot of fruits, vegetables, and salads. Um, Alicia, did you have any particular diet changes um, for yourself when you transitioned between the different modalities? Yes, um, mine was phosphorus. I always had trouble with my phosphorus or my potassium being too low. Um, I did have to switch up. I had to learn like different foods that first I would learn what foods has potassium and phosphorus. Reading the label, I had to learn how to read a label and check. Um, they were very helpful with teaching me how to read a label. Um, mine were just finding foods that didn't have that much um, in them, but I feel like it's like as long as you do everything correctly. I didn't do a plant based. I still ate a regular, like kidney friendly diet on my end. But once you find what works for you, it really works. Yeah, and I will uh, go ahead and plug American Kidney Fund here on their website. Um, they have the Kidney Health Kitchen there for recipes and dietitian tips that is posting out awesome content, as well as uh, there's some videos on the American Kidney Fund uh, YouTube page there um, from dietitians um, with more detailed questions and answers relating to these issues. So, uh, Louis, thanks for that question. Um, so, Randall and Tom, I was asking, uh, can you use a CPAP machine while also doing peritoneal dialysis? I think it's the... Uh, question here. Uh, so, Dr. Bernays? Absolutely. Absolutely. Very common. No problem at all. Yeah, Not I think uh, most common thing tends to be from patients on the support groups I run is, you know, they have different machines with them um, to get used to, but there's also some advancements in CPAP technology as well to make it a little bit easier for folks. Um, all right, um, Daniel, we talked about the placement of tubing a little bit earlier, so feel free to check out the replay uh, towards the end of the session. Unfortunately, uh, we, we don't have time to go back. Um, but one last question from William um, about swimming. What type of water is acceptable for those kid, PD patients that can swim? Um, and then, um, yeah, we also mentioned a little bit about the care needs uh, that Alicia mentioned when she got, got out of the water, she changed her dressing and showered off there. So what type of water um, for swimming is appropriate? So, Patricia, you correct me if, you're, if I'm wrong, but my, my teaching always has been ideally avoided, <laughs> you know, avoided. Um, salt water in the ocean is preferred. Uh, if you have your own pool, chlorinated pool that is yours, you, no one else is coming in there, I, I personally would feel more comfortable. Uh, but that's usually the recommendation. So ocean preferred, if not salty water or your own pool. Uh, would be a preferred water. That's what I've been advised as well. Um, and so that should help um, for some of the folks that are used to water sports as well as living close to the ocean and choosing peritoneal dialysis as their uh, chosen dialysis modality. Uh, we're going to sort of start closing up here in the next three minutes here and uh, ask our go around with our panelists. What are some of your recommendations or things that maybe we didn't touch on that you'd like to share with the patients today um, to encourage them to explore peritoneal dialysis? So we'll start with you, Alicia. Um, I just think PD is great because you, have, especially like, um, when I got on, I was 25, I'm 27 now, especially being in your 20s, you want to still go out and have fun and be on the move. So like, I'm just saying from my experience, if you're younger, um, it does give you more of freedom to do stuff. Like again, I'm still able to travel, see my friends and still go out and have fun. So I do recommend PD a lot because I, it just gives you more energy. It just get, basically kind of gives you your life back to you. It gives you a little bit more life and more energy, in my opinion. Thanks, Alicia. Nurse Patterson? I think that PD is a great bridge to transplant because you're going to continue to keep your residual function. So when you get the transplant, the kidneys and the bladders are ready to work right away, right on the table, um, as opposed to someone who hasn't had any urine, the bladder kind of shrivels up and has to get used to working again. And so sometimes there's a delay, you have to do dialysis before your transplant is really working. But with PD, it works right away. Dr. Bermudez. You guys took all my ideas. I completely <laughs> agree with everything. And, and I think uh, what I could add to all of those wonderful things is that you can very much do this on your own. 
um, you don't necessarily need assistance. Uh, I have a lot of patients, even older patients, uh, that do a fantastic job with minimal assistance. And on the other spectrum uh, of, of the patients that are a little more limited in movement, transportation, it's hard to move back and forth to a dialysis unit, having someone at home that can give you that assistance is something that really works wonders. Uh, it could be a great way to have quality of life, stay in the comfort of home. As we've mentioned, uh, this is gentle. Uh, so most patients could have a very good um, experience, uh, even at the older stages of life. So it's very dynamic. I think it works for the young, active, independent, but also could be the best choice for someone that needs more assistance. Yeah, definitely. And uh, thank you for all the panelists. Uh, having uh, been on training for peritoneal dialysis, this was home hemodialysis. I enjoy not sticking myself with a needle every time I had to do treatments. And it certainly extended my life in terms of getting back to work, traveling a lot more on peritoneal dialysis. So thank you for being awesome panelists. And thank you, attendees, for your awesome questions today. We hope you learned something. And uh, we're going to toss you back to the main.